or somebody who's you know got psychiatric problems or you know uh, you know new age whatever uh, just the mention of those words the fact that it triggers that response in your mind you automatically think that uh, that uh, anyone who says that is is off the wall and flaky uh, shows how much your mind has been influenced because sure. flying saucers are real man-made machines and there's no proof that they're not man-made but there's plenty of proof that they exist and, uh, and, and it goes back quite a few years and uh, this kind of technology that you have the article there on now that's the kind of tech that's the kind of article that you find in a magazine about something that where they want to make you think well we're working on the problem of this advanced flight system right. like these that sort of implies that they're recognizing that UFOs exist so they're doing a uh, kind of a uh, uh, a uh, backpedaling somewhat to yeah. try and it's shore like, up uh, things in the scientific community that, you know... Uh, we're working on the problem right. and, and, and if you, maybe if you, we'll get there someday. Yeah, if, if you don't like the flaky stuff that we've, we've been publishing, maybe you'll like something that we put in Aviation Week of Space Technology. Uh, the article is called Air Spike uh, Could Ease Hypersonic Flight Problems. And in this article, it's very interesting because if you do take a look at Mr. Lyon's book and then you read this article, it's funny how it's almost like everybody's saying the same thing. This article was published May 15th, 1995, which was released concurrently with the second edition of Mr. Lyon's book. I'm sure that was just a coincidence. The first thing that they talk about is the flight characteristics. Estimates indicate that an air spike equipped vehicle traveling at Mach 25 orbital velocity with respect to the exterior of the oblique shockwave would actually be subjected to Mach 3 conditions within the pocket formed behind the wave. How is that possible if gravity is not affected? Well, that would be, you know, 17,500 miles an hour, of course. And uh, they're basically, you see, this kind of article, they're not going to use this technology. They just put this article out to make you think they're working on, on the problem. Uh, they're trying to uh, make you think that there's some standard way to make a using ordinary shockwave mechanics and uh, uh, electrodynamics and uh, gas dynamics and other scientific uh, disciplines that they can make a ship go as fast as flying saucers have been reported to go. Which well, it's Which, interesting that they don't even explain why uh, you feel Mach 3 conditions behind the shock wave when you're traveling Mach 25. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty amazing in itself. The article should be on just that. Well, uh, they're, what they're saying is uh, that this, this air spike gadget, which is out in front of this, this little ship, which is shaped kind of like a little pill, uh, the little spike sticks out, and then there's a little sting on the end. When the sting's not in operation, they say you've got to... You, you've got a, a conical shock wave, and when the sting is in operation, it uh, operating at something like 35 megawatts power, and it's a it's a plasma arc torch on the end of the sting, that it creates a, a parabolic wave, which reduces the pressure behind it and reduces the heat transfer problems that are associated with that kind of high velocity. But it's just a theory. It's still. It's been, you know, they tested it in a wind tunnel, but they're not going to use it. The second page of this, which shows the diagram, discusses for speeds above Mach 1, the vehicle rely, would rely on a magnetohydrodynamic fan engine. The lens-shaped craft would have an interior rectifying antenna to absorb pulsed, focused microwave power on the outside of the vehicle to ionize air forced to the rim of the craft by the air spike. The rectennas, which they like to call it, also would pulse electric power through the ionized air, and in conjunction with two superconducting magnets ringing the craft, accelerate the air aft past the vehicle. According to Mirabo, which is the scientist involved in this wonderful device, this drive system also tends to eliminate sonic booms, gee, just like what, I wonder, by eliminating <laughs> pressure discontinuities, so the vehicle is silent but very bright in hypersonic operations. So we have a lens-shaped glowing object that is f silent in flight. 
that he's speculating that someday we might have. Yes, and what's interesting is, is the technology's wrong for that kind of uh, propulsion, and they're making it look like uh, that this is just on the horizon. Uh, only 40-something years after the one I saw that, that uh, didn't make a sonic boom, did not have an air spike gadget on it, and uh, went between 9,000, possibly 25,000 miles per hour in three seconds. Uh, now, it did two 90-degree turns at above 200 miles per hour, absolutely square turns, and went to the point of infinity, which was the point at which I could no longer see the craft. So the speed of that craft would be determined by how far away I could see it. And uh, I had noticed that I could see my geodesic dome in Hyde Park, uh, which was about 30 miles from my home at the time. I could see my geodesic dome, which was 32 feet in diameter, so I have since revised my uh, statements about the saucer that I believe it was doing more like 25,000 miles per hour. So it was orbital velocity already? Yes. In 1952? Yes, 1953. 1953. In uh, late summer of 1953, and, and there were six other people that I know of who were witnessing it, who were with me at the time. And That's interesting. Uh, it's interesting that the same scientist, uh, this character named Mirabo, uh, we now have up on the screen uh, in Popular Science an article uh, by the same scientist, uh, Mirabo, who was talking about spinning this, this wonderful little saucer-shaped uh, object you see here with, with lasers, kind of like that guy on uh, uh, the Ed Sullivan show who used to spin plates on, on a stick. This guy does it on lasers now. Apparently, this guy's job is to keep creating saucer-shaped gadgets to keep us amused and thinking that uh, things that, are still being uh, worked on. Yeah, that uses known technology rather than concealed technology. So we have a totally different timeline than our friend Mirabo here. Yes. Just to finish up on some wonderful disinformation, we have a, another saucer developed by uh, Lockheed. This one, of course, has a, uh, right smack in the middle of it, a fan jet engine so that this thing can fly somehow <laughs> and uh, basically just tear itself apart uh, in mid-flight. But, uh, you know... That device would, would burn the ship up from the friction of the gases entering the vents if it was enough to propel the ship. The only magazine even anywhere near them, Nexus magazine, which is more... Which, about, which is out of the country. Yeah, it's Australian. Yeah. So it's not... And it they've done a short review, about, uh, you know, a couple of column inches on the sure. book. Was it favorable? Uh, it was... Usually they get everything wrong. They misquote me and... Oh. and uh, there have been a few writers who have written books, There's, uh, and they will say things that I didn't, you know, say that I said things that I didn't say, get me confused with other people, so and totally distort what I said. But do you feel that that is deliberate? Sure, certainly it is. So uh, do you feel that uh, Nexus, then, is not a good example of something that's independent either? I don't think so. I think they're, the fact that they, uh, when I first, when they did the... Uh, they had a change of ownership uh, after they did the review, and they had more interesting, uh, from my standpoint, they had more interesting material in there. Now they have more off-the-wall type of articles and so forth, what I consider off-the-wall. I noticed skeptic. that they've been running these long string of bloodline of Jesus and, and things oh, yeah. of that nature, and uh, Which, Wind Walker uh, series. Uh, Chupacabra. In yeah. fact, they, uh, this, this brings to mind uh, an article that they stuck in about some eyewitness to the, um, the, the fireballs, or the, the ones that followed the uh, B-17s in yes. World War II, the Foo Fighters. Yes. And this guy went out of his way to, to say that they were definitely extraterrestrial. And I couldn't help but think about your book and your take on the whole subject. And it just seemed to me incongruous even for Nexus to put something as uninteresting as, as that in, in their magazine. Well, there, really there are things about the fireballs, what they call the fireballs, fireball, uh, which Kugelblitz uh, is the German word they use to fire, fire lightning, basically, would mean, uh, which indicate they were manned aircraft. And yet uh, you get a, a 
a whole misinformational network that insists that there's some sort of little bitty balls like this. Well, the thing about a ball that's peculiar is when you see a ball shape, you can't tell how far away it is from you or how large it is. Sure. If you're inside that ball, it looks much larger than it is. If you're on the outside of the ball, it tends to look smaller. That's something I discovered when I built the geodesic dome. And from the outside, it looked a lot smaller, but when you were inside, it was huge. So the spheres uh, have, have a problem with uh, reference to scale. Yeah, they, they uh, tend to in shrink. The open environment. But it would only take, with the kind of technology that's used in flying saucer propulsion, it would only take a four-foot ball to get up a uh, small person and the power system and everything inside. And the thing about the fireballs that makes them, that tells you that they're man-made and that they're not robot ships that are energy projected from the ground uh, is the fact that they followed the bombers and did all kinds of little maneuvers uh, that would be far away from any ground base that could be doing the controlling. So they, they basically had to have a man on board to do that, probably a boy, probably in the Hitler Jugend, uh, trained just for this purpose. And all their, their main purpose was was to disrupt the communications and to, it was like a red herring, the mm. distraction, because they were bombing the, the heck out of uh, Germany at the time they got these things into the And the fact the sky. that the, uh, the, the electromagnetic uh, radiation that they would uh, create would disrupt circuits, wouldn't they, if yes. they got close by? Yeah, they don't need any special technology. I've got article upon article written about how this technology worked to disrupt the communications, and I've got news for them. It takes no special technology. The flying saucer's uh, propulsion system will disrupt communications Absolutely. if it comes close to them. E even, in the, uh, yeah. even in the extraterrestrial literature that they like to give us, uh, cars still burn out, cars uh, stall out and start up later when, when the thing passes by. Uh, things of that nature. My father was helped for between 15 minutes and a half hour by one of these uh, ships outside Level Land, Texas, 1957, and he said nothing about it to me, and it wasn't until I turned on the morning news that I realized that he, his car lights were all burned out. He had to have them replaced, and that's when I realized that, uh, that he'd been, he had had this experience with the ship, and so I went down to the Ford Motor Plant in Odessa, Texas, uh, Ford Motor house where they sold the cars and fixed them and walked up to him and I said why didn't you say you saw a flying saucer and he said well how did you know about it and I said I just turned on the morning news and there were a lot of people that had experiences last night and the mechanic uh, said uh, you know this is the first time I've ever seen all the lights on a car burned out and not one blown fuse <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't seen too many UFO uh, related car problems uh, <laughs> The Germans were building dozens of weapons from Tesla's papers, and including a um, uh, something that might be called a Foo Fighter. Yes, uh. and the Schildkröte, the Fliegende Schildkröte, was a flying turtle, which is just another name for a type of Foo Fighter. Except that, what I've found is that there are several different types of ships. One is a linear, what I call a linear type of ship, and then the other one is is a is a round ship, and uh, the the linear ships have a different control system for turning them, uh, whereas the round ships turn in a number of directions. And uh, <coughs> they, they turn peripherally. They can go backwards, forwards, right, left, whereas the linear ships tend to turn their one end in the direction of travel, uh, maybe two directions in case of some of the cigar-shaped ships. But uh, the uh, the this particular type, the flying turtle type, appeared to be the kind that I saw in the U.S. Air Force intelligence films that were made over Germany in World War II, and, and uh, I had heard I had heard various references to these things that they were unmanned and all this kind of stuff, and that just wasn't true. No, they had a pilot. You could see the cockpit. It, it would seem more difficult to have remote-controlled devices in the time period that we're talking about than it would to have an actual pilot. Yeah. which in their minds would be expendable. Well, the uh, film that I saw was had some humor. That you could laugh if you saw it because the ship... Uh, you're the describing a, 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 a gun camera uh, yes. footage that you had seen? Yes, well, it were... was actually... <laughs> the camera operator was behind the gunners. Uh, 
ordinarily they, they mount a camera on guns that takes photos as they shoot, but in this case the, the camera operator